Dus je hebt zelf ook een ruimte. Ja. Oh, dat was een beetje Nou ja, oké, okay, zo dan is het nu. Kun je hier meer kaffel en nog inwis staan? Dat is alleen dit jaar. Ja, det er bare ikke nogen, men øh, følg nu med det. Det er præmissen til de her slags ting, hvor ja, man vil fast sige. Det er det faktisk. Vi har tænkt, folk var sådan i folkemødestemningen, og de dukkede op. Det gør de ikke hende. Hvad siger du? Der er ikke en fejlmaskine, der er skrevet morgen. Welcome. So, good morning, everybody. We have been looking so much forward, especially me, <laughs> for this presentation or this talk by Gitte. By Gitte. Ditte. Lysgaard Vip. And um, first of all, I would like to uh, share with you that the, in the beginning, I think it was in 2017, that's Like this, yeah. In 2017, I met Dita for the first time. He, she was helping me to produce a design guide within plastics packaging. It was quite interesting and a, a lot of hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and then you moved afterwards to uh, to the building and uh, architecture, um, and have been doing a lot of hard work within that position. Uh, especially within recycling, reuse, and this agenda. And it's so impressive what you've been doing. Uh, also your books. Uh, and we look very much forward to, to hear about your work. Uh, and I guess there will be a talk and a presentation. And then afterwards, there will be, it will be possible to ask some questions, right, from the audience. So a very warm welcome. If there are any points missing out, then we are going to, to tape it all and put it on our uh, homepage afterwards. Uh, and we're also streaming it right now. So say something clever when you ask the questions. <laughs> welcome, Dieter. Thank you and thanks for having me. <clears throat> I've been looking very much forward to this. As Christina mentioned, uh, years back, we, uh, we had the innovation forum for uh, circular plastic packaging. So it's a uh, it's been a long partnership with back and forth. Um, I'm going to do it fairly uh, sort of informal today and just do a talk. I didn't bring the slides that I, I normally do. Uh, I brought some materials instead so you can feel that with your hands in, instead. I thought that might be nice in this setting. So also, if you have questions uh, as we go along, you're also more than welcome to just pop up your hand and then we can We can take it as we go, <laughs> but um, is it uncomfortable? But I think I'll start with just a, a brief intro to me. Um, I started working with Circular Economy back in 14 or 15 uh, with a product as a service business model, meaning it was a baby clothing company that uh, rather than uh, selling for uh, exchange value, then uh, renting out clothes in a use value closed system. And what that brought to me was this sort of understanding that when we start designing for circularity, so designing of the product, but also very much the business model, we can make uh, business and climate actually be friends rather than foes. So rather than just sub-optimizing a, a broken system, we could in that sense incentivize quality and the better the quality of the product, the more, the more it could be used, the better the business model. So in that case, if it was used less than four times, it would be uh, sort of red numbers at the, at the dotted line of, of, the, uh, of the business. Whereas if it was used more than four times, we were actually profitable in, in that sense. So really finding those way where circular economy becomes a tool that uh, can mean that we can deliver on in terms of providing value for people while staying within the planetary boundaries. And from there, 
moving into the built environment and, and very much with a focus there still. It's very difficult once you started working with buildings uh, where the problem is so enormous that the opportunity, of course, becomes similar uh, enormous for the for the effect and the positive effect you can have. So kind of got stuck in buildings, but also in design in general. And that's what I'll share about today, uh, because after the summer holiday, I'll release my second book, which is called uh, Danish Design Heritage and Global Sustainability. And the premise for that is obviously uh, we are we're quite, you know, we're in very big trouble <laughs> and from a climate perspective. We, we know that uh, from the countless amount of data that has been collected, highlighting science has for years and years and years uh, continuously told us how troubled we are. Yet what we uh, lack, I believe, is an, <clears throat> a common vision of where to go. So if we know what we need to move away from, uh, we know less about what to move towards. How might that look? How might that smell? How might that feel? If we really want to do that transformation, how could, could that look? And one example uh, that we're sitting in the midst of today is uh, the biking culture of, of Copenhagen as a, as a one sort of way in which the municipality of Copenhagen designed a new type of infrastructure got people to use bikes rather than cars. That became a positive case for the city because it didn't encourage tourism, it encouraged new types of businesses, it encouraged uh, investments into the city, while at the same time moving us away from fossil fuels in a way that was um, desirable for us. So it wasn't a, um, <clears throat> a negative constraint, it was actually something that is easier and better to do for yourself, for the environment, uh, and for our <clears throat> health costs. I'll just have a quick... It's been raining quite a bit these days, so it's like a... Yeah, nonetheless. But, so great troubles and not really knowing where we want to go. Uh, and one of the learnings that I found was that I work best if I'm optimistic. So I forward this notion from uh, Cristiana Figueres, the, uh, for, the former um, leader of the COP21, which she says that her goal is to be a stubborn optimist. So optimism not understood as someone who doesn't uh, read the IPCC reports or doesn't get the reports, but someone who works very hard on staying optimistic because that's a way where we can be constructive in what we want to do. So uh, I've very much cho chosen that approach. And the key thing being, you know, not waiting for um, the hockey stick as we kind of see it in Denmark, but that we actually work really hard on staying optimistic and on the solutions that we want to do. And luckily I've uh, had great, the great pleasure of working with a lot of um, innovators that, that do the work and do the grind. So, so really looking towards how can we incentivize action as much as possible. We've had so much talk, pres <laughs> present session included, but, but so how do we move from, from all that talk and all those pilot projects that we have seen for the last many, many years and really move to, to a scale perspective, a scale in a Danish context, but of course also very much from a global sustainability con concept because um, it won't do much good if we fix the problem in Denmark, but don't really create the solutions that can be scaled in a, in a global world because, uh, well, then, then we won't really have done a lot. So how do we get... <laughs> I'll try to stand still. <laughs> it's difficult, but I'll try. Um, no, so how do we move it to a, to a global scale? And what I saw was that there's this uh, opportunity in, <clears throat> we've moved into the Anthropocene time. So we were in the Holocene time where we had a stable uh, climate, stable environment, and it wasn't, uh, our, our natural environment wasn't driven by human actions in terms of behavioral change within the environment. That's no longer the case in the Anthropocene. We know that it is our actions that uh, creates change for the environment. So essentially we have 
the responsibility, the opportunity to realize that what we do affects the climate, which affects our ability to thrive on planet Earth. So if we really take that in and internalize that from a science perspective, um, we can go back to this sort of realm of Thomas Kuhn, the, uh, the old um, science theoretist who talked about uh, scientific revolutions and scientific paradigms and how that, what, what happens when there are those large changes where our fundamental knowledge changes. And one thing that makes it very interesting for me to look at as the sort of understanding of the Anthropocene and the fact that we're now realizing, you know, we, it's, it's a fundamental uh, knowledge gain that we now know what we do affects the planet. We didn't used to know that. Uh, we, we, we simply thought that we could, could do whatever and it wouldn't be affected. But so if we really internalize that knowledge, that's uh, a knowledge gain. And if we look at the scientific revolutions, they are all uh, driven by the fact that they were uh, very scary in the start because we didn't know what we were moving towards. But ultimately, they've all created um, improvement beyond what we could imagine. So the sort of the 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 the, the uh, a key or sort of the the, the most sort of uh, obvious example of a scientific revolution would be when we thought that the world was flat, and then realized the Earth was actually round. And so in the beginning, it was extremely scary. Like, would you could you literally you know walk off a cliff one day and then just fall into to nothing? And would your buildings no longer work? What 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 would happen? But ultimately, it just brought us so much good. And that's what I hope we will also get when we really start understanding climate change and understanding the world we live in, that possibly we can use that change for improvement, for better. And so for me, uh, the way to trying to push that new paradigm forward um, and finding that opportunity of what a world might look like, uh, I really looked to design and in particular the Danish design heritage. And the reason for that is if we take design first, what design is extremely good at is one, to stay with the troubles. So really that we uh, get comfortable in, in the problems and, 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 and really dive into how do, we, how do we solve problems, not just on the surface, but actually at the root cause. And that, that takes that we are comfortable with really diving into problems without having the solutions to those problems. So that's one thing. And then the other thing, which is, um, you know, we're used to it from a very sort of um, tangible example, but design's ability to shape something that wasn't there. So, so going back to that point of how do we actually see, see in, try to imagine a world that we don't yet know? What would, you know, everybody's talking about uh, net zero and neutrality and all of that. But if we try to really go through that experiment, what would a, a, a net zero city actually look like? How would a net zero country look like? How would a region look like? What would it actually be? What materials would we have? How would we engage with each other? How would our buildings look like? And, and really try to work with how do we make it tangible so that hopefully we can um, get excited about something and, and, and fight for something that we might actually look toward, uh, look forward to. Um, historically, we've been better at human ingenuity, at innovation, from a perspective of wanting to move towards something. It's difficult if, if despair is the only driver uh, as we're currently seeing. So that's design, but then combined with, um, with the Danish design heritage, what from that perspective is super interesting for me is um, if you look at Danish aesthetics, there's this um, part of the aesthetics, part of where, what has made Danish design so popular is that it really uh, sprout forward after the uh, First and Second World War. And there was an embedded part of having that social purpose of democratizing, of creating welfare and well-being for the population. So it wasn't super expensive. There wasn't a lot of ornaments. There was really that sort of form follows function that it had to have a higher purpose rather than being uh, design um, for, for the purpose of design in itself. So taking that social purpose that they found uh, to be a positive creative constraint 
not something that made the design worse, but something that actually heightened the ambition and created something better. So if we can learn from that and use the planetary boundaries as a similar um, positive creative constraint, because if we look at design, it's uh, barriers has always been a given. You know, you get a brief, there's, there's, there's always barriers to design, and usually it's something that we've used as a tool to do better. But I think the problem when we talk about sustainability, when we talk about the planetary boundaries, that for too long it's been used as a sort of um, an opportunity to do less good. So it would, it would be okay that it would be, you know, inconvenient, uglier, uh, more expensive, and all of these different things. So if we instead start using it as a positive creative constraint, there might be opportunity to be had there. And then the other side, the thing that I think is really interesting is more from a business model and how we structure our society in that um, what they were successful at and what we also still see in terms of, of, the, of, the, of the things in circulation is a focus on use rather than exchange value. So if you look at buildings today or how we go about uh, a lot of the, the ways in terms of recreating businesses, uh, it's less about the societal problem solving, it's less about the use value and it's more about the exchange value. So the built environment as, a, as an example, um, in the good old days, and it's not to, to romanticize that too much, but you would have a developer that would develop a building with the purpose of providing that societal value, solving that societal problem. And then you would have a financial sector that provided a service for that developer and they would make a, a profit on that, and that's great, uh, but they would be a service sector. Whereas today, we've unfortunately kind of flipped that around to some degree, so we're almost as if the built environment has become an asset class to such a degree that we've now become the service sector to the financial sector uh, rather than vice versa. So finding that, uh, well, acknowledging that and then moving from that towards how can we once again get a focus on, on use value and make sure that we uh, move towards business models such as product as a service so that we once again have a financial incentive to create that use value rather than an a sole focus on the exchange value when we sell a product or sell a building and no one really cares about what happens after that. And for that, of course, circular economy for me is a, is a key tool. Uh, so I kind of I try to differentiate it between four things. So there's uh, reduce. How do we get better at reducing what we use? I'll use the built environment as a case again, because it is what I know the best. But there the UN estimates that uh, until 2040, we have to um, build the amount of square meters that is the entirety of Manhattan every month. So that just being an, an, an enormous task. So even when we look towards innovations and new materials and whatnot, we, we still need to find new ways of creating value for, for uh, our human populations while reducing. So how might we go about being ambitious in providing buildings where people don't have to use the same amount of square meters that we do here in Denmark in order to feel value, to feel happy, to feel uh, the, the sort of the content in having a, a nice home. How can we use creativity to find new ways of going about that and reducing the amount we need? That also, of course, being from a materials perspective, from a consumerism perspective, reduce is just a fundamental need, uh, but it should be focused on behavioral change and new types of uh, systems and models. I'll use this as an opportunity to... And then the next is reuse. So reusing as much as possible and reusing being where we don't need the processing that we do when we recycle, which is the third. We also still need to very much recycle uh, a lot of things. I think if we look at, at our homes, we can see a lot of things coming into waste, uh, becoming wasted in the next couple of years. So how do we find smart ways to, to utilize that kind of working with a duality of uh, designing the world of tomorrow with the waste of today while working towards designing a world without waste. So how do we balance that gap between we have all these waste streams? Uh, how do we make do with that? And um, from, a, from a personal experience perspective, 
what we've really worked with, and maybe I'll share some of the materials here. One, because it's also the plastic pavilion, so I brought our plastics project, which is uh, for yeah. for Carlsberg. They have these draft master kegs. Um, this is also from there, just a different test. But they have these draft master kegs that um, would would have otherwise been incinerated because they're plastic composite. So how can we uh, use design to find a new use for it? while make also realizing that hopefully one day they will innovate in order to the, for the kegs to be reused rather than recycled. So on the one side, we needed to find a desirable design, but also design a value chain and a business model where we weren't uh, taking in huge capex cost in terms of setting up our own production because fundamentally, you know, if, if they find a, a way to reuse that material, we should all be happy rather than seeing shit, we, we still have quite a long way to go in terms of our return on investment. So making sure that we are incentivizing a better future and continuous improvement rather than finding uh, ways in which we end up just doing business as usual in a bit of a new new way, really being mindful of how do we, how do we concurrently uh, incentivize that change? Because also being mindful that uh, if we really, if we, action matters, so also that perfect doesn't get in the way of good. So it's unlikely that we will today, tomorrow, the next two or three years, create the perfect solutions. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't act and get going. So really being mindful of that we need several iterations to get us there. So how do we really start working with and appreciating the, the first types of, of, of iterations while being mindful that we should, of course, continue to do as much as possible. It's going to be a thousand or ten thousand moonshots to get us there, not just not just one sort of single silver bullet. And I mentioned that there were four R's, so we have uh, re uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And the fourth for me is replace. So finding replacement materials is also, I think, going to be a key part of the future. We have, um, especially from a from a nature perspective, more and more interesting solutions already here but it's sort of the first generation of of biomaterials and i brought a bit of it as well here this is uh one of the matos products where they use coffee shelves and this is um a soils uh, eelgrass uh acoustics so it's just to highlight that now there's actually in market commercialized a lot of new nature-based materials and it's only the first iteration of it. If you look, uh, which for me is super interesting, that uh, while the built environment has not traditionally been uh, particularly good in, in innovation, uh, you have a life science industry in Denmark that's been really good at innovation. So now with this sort of next level, next generation of biogene materials such as algae, mycelium, etc., you have a life science sector that's starting to uh, merge into the built environment because they see an opportunity to utilize all of their knowledge and all that their experience with these um, living organisms and, and in, in engineering them to do uh, what we would uh, what we would like them to do. So just seeing that there is a grand opportunity also if we start working with nature uh, rather than against nature because there's um, I mean it's unfortunate there's sort of almost because we we uh, Oh, wait. <laughs> Basement. No, but just to say, if we look since the uh, since the industrial uh, the third industrial revolution and maybe even before, there's been this sort of tendency to we wanted to really explore our human ingenuity in terms of what could we from a technology perspective achieve? How could we uh, you know almost move as far away from nature as possible? Because it was a testament to what we from a, from an ingenuity perspective could do. And hopefully now, if we start looking towards, okay, 
maybe it shouldn't be either or if we work with nature and then put our all of our human ingenuity and all of our technology on top of that rather than seeing them as opposites hopefully there's a there's an there's an abundance of opportunities that could really uh, drive us to that much better place um, than we know today so i think i'll leave it there of that sort of that that's some of the reason why i choose to be that stubborn optimist because um we won't get there unless we do a lot of hard work for it but if we put in that effort and really get to work today tomorrow and start acting and creating that change then there's there's no reason why it shouldn't be possible to get to a better place so yeah i'll leave it there Thank you very much, Didi. It was very interesting. <laughs> yeah. So now you have the opportunity to ask all of your questions to Didi, and I will get around. I have this uh, small um, microphone. And uh, these questions or reflections or comments? Yeah, and, uh, comments, inputs. whatever you like. So who will be the first one? Over mm -hmm. here, maybe? What are your thoughts about it? Do you think it's, it's possible? Anybody? Over here? Yeah. Um, how can consumers... Sorry, is this okay? Okay, how can consumers try to help the agenda if you don't have a company where you can produce new products? How is... Um, or what can we do sort of to improve the agenda or move in the right direction? That's a really good question and it's a really difficult one, right? I always have that sort of system versus individual and if, if we we need to work on on both at the same side so i think um the easiest is to reduce use less especially in in this in in our parts of the world there's an opportunity to just do less of course that doesn't work on a global scale uh, but but reduce is something that we could really be mindful of from a consumer perspective and then of course when we do use stuff creating that demand for the new types of solutions is crucial, right? So that we support the innovative solutions that are there and are also mindful of that, you know, they might not be perfect in their first iteration. Um, failure is a key part of the journey to success. So how do we also get better at, at supporting failure and, and not seeing it as something that we should uh, you know, stay quiet about not really want to talk with each other about, but 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 rather celebrating them and and supporting when when they happen. And then, as much as we are consumers, we're also citizens. So of course, uh, a key thing is when we go to the voting booth, whenever that happens, whether it's for you know local politicians, national or or European. I have a question over here. Thank you, Hi, Didi. Thank you for being here today. Full disclosure, I work with the Danish plastic uh, uh, industry. Um, in terms of circularity, what's your uh, view on plastic in a, in, a, in, a, yeah, in a circular economy? Yeah, so I think for me, plastic is a brilliant material and it will be continue to be a brilliant material that we will need. And similarly with all other materials, we should find the best use for it and where, where that should be. And there'll be more, I mean, that's that's the thing with the transformation, right? If we look at it both from a creating value from a, for a global population, but also the energy transition and everything, we need all of the materials that are efficient and, and, and provide and plastics is an extremely efficient material. So we will need that for the future. And then we just need to get better at finding high value recycling schemes for it. Um, and maybe also looking more into when can you know what can we what can we produce it with here in Denmark there's a lot of focus on <clears throat> power to x and power to x has nafta as a as a as a uh, waste material almost from that perspective so can we find new ways of producing high quality plastics without extracting oil for it and and it seems like there's a lot of opportunity for that and another question so i love your positive uh perspective on the world and on the future um, but I know there must also be some barriers so what do you focus on saying the barriers the, the the strongest barriers for the for the building sector to to change towards yeah. a circular economy 
Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good point. Um, one interesting perspective because I think for a long time we've been talking about technical barriers, and so we needed to create new innovations because we were lacking the solutions, and we should continue to innovate on solutions. But fact of the matter is that we have more than plenty of the technical solutions there. We've just seen so many pilot projects done in the last five to seven years, but they're not being scaled. So we have the knowledge, we're just not utilizing. And for me, that means that the, the, the key barriers are more on culture, on um, systemic change of that from exchange to use value. How do we incentivize the market to move towards new ways of going? So from a building perspective, I, I, I think um, the new regulations from the Daining building homes that you have to stay below 12 kilos uh, CO2 is really great because it creates awareness in the market and it creates it's, it starts to create a demand for, for the new solutions. And then we move forward from there and having that dialogue where rather than it being regulators saying you should use this or this or this, saying here's what you need to deliver on CO2. And then you use your innovative abilities to find the best ways to get Get, get there and also being mindful that this is only the first target it will continuously go down so that that's also a very clear signal to the market that this is the beginning you need to find, you need to implement better and better solutions but that's 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 also saying that the technical abilities is actually already here it's it's more about scaling them and and finding that incentive structure to do so Are there any further questions for for you guys? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, it might be a rather specific question, mm -hmm. but um, I saw up here there's uh, a, um, an overview of uh, bioplastics and the the the, the, the division of uh, regular plastics and and bioplastics. So. Do you know the the amount of uh, waste plastics which are actually swimming around, you know, in the seas and everywhere? And and would it instead of growing bio materials to use in bioplastics, would it be more useful to just reuse all the plastics that we have? Do you have a? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, from my perspective, we need to do both because the problem is that grand, right? Which, if we're talking about um, a world of 9 billion people and, and the amount of people that need, you know, that has yet to have, you know, a roof over their head and running water and all these different things, um, that the grandness of that challenge is just uh, mind boggling in, in a sort of scale, multitude scale. So we would need both to, to get there. And I think that's, I mean, that's what makes it so difficult, right? That it, it it's, uh, it's, it has to be this puzzle of solutions coming together, and then we are mindful of that. Would we, you know, when we have the bio materials, we use them for the for the best possible purpose, and when we have the the uh, the waste plastics coming in, we use that for the best possible purpose, and that goes into you know, what are what are the recycling facilities, what are the production facilities, and that's a that's something where it's it, it to me it looks like there's an opportunity to really coordinate that as best as possible. So now we you know we look at what are our capabilities and our capacity within recycling and make sure that we then get the waste material into um, the best streams possible. Because if we really move towards a circular economy, you would, uh, you, you should, if we're successful at that, end up with, with um, a demand-based uh, market for, for the waste materials, right? So it's, that becomes sort of like a, who gets the access to, to, the, to the material waste streams in the future and that we're mindful of that we move them into the best possible uh, use and that being about how we best deliver value for people while staying within the planetary boundaries. And speaking of planetary boundaries, so we have met some scientists saying that if you're going to live within the planetary boundaries in the future, you need to have like 3.2 square meters or something like that in your building uh, and live a bit per person. Yeah, per yeah. person. So what do you think about that perspective? And are we as consumers and citizens, are we, do we, can we manage to live in that way? I think 
a keep that we will have to live on fewer square meters, but that, and that coming back to that, seeing the planetary boundaries as a positive creative constraint. So I don't think it'll be three square meters per person. I don't think we have the ability to, to deliver on value within that, but maybe it's 20 square meters per person because we get much smarter about how we optimize our design of our buildings and create that communal spaces that has a high value where there's some of the things that we're doing privately that we actually want to use in a, in a communal perspective. If you look at, I mean, Copenhagen, uh, I think it was last year they had like the municipality literally put up posters on the, on the bus signs where it was remember to say hi to your neighbor because uh, loneliness was so so such a problem in the city, which is like crazy, right? That the municipality feels like it needs to tell us to say hi to our neighbors. But it's just to say, if we if we take those multitude of problems and turn it into solutions where communal spaces will be uh, a key part of that, but it won't be, I mean, I think that's, that's also that it has to be behavioral change, the reduction of square meters with new innovations where we can, you know, if we, if we, if we look at the reuse and recycling of materials, if we look at the biogene materials where we are essentially storing carbon rather than uh, emitting carbon in, in our buildings, that also provides a, an opportunity for maybe saying it doesn't have to be three square meters, but it could be the 20 square meters or something of that sort. <laughs> so the argument that uh, circular economy will be a, a huge boundary, uh, you don't you don't grab that. You don't think that well, that's the way forward. Or it, I've I've just met that argument when I'm in a debate saying, mm. well, we're going back to the Stone Age and uh, we're not going to be able to live in that way. So you see it as a as a possibility instead. Yeah, I mean, I think that's also you know whether we talk about technology or circular economy, there's an opportunity to be both friend and foe, depending on how we use it. And that it, ha you know, it has to come back to that. Are we delivering value for people while staying within the planetary boundaries? Because uh, it doesn't work if it's not getting us closer to staying within the planetary boundaries, but it also doesn't work if it's not providing value for people. So it's, yeah. Any questions from the audience? Hi. Um, I was just wondering because in the beginning you were talking about. I'm actually not sure what the question is, but um, I really liked uh, that you were using the, um, the terms or the illustration of the, the planet being flat, yeah. uh, and then that we realized that it's round, um, and it took us some time to adapt to this. Uh, what the challenge I think is that how is how about time now? Mm -hmm. Because as you say, it's a okay. How how can we turn into circular economy and stay positive, uh, believing in it's okay to, that uh, the innovations are imperfect at the moment. How do we push if it's uh, consumers, what can the consumers do or is it, is it due to regulations or, or is it both? Uh, I, I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm working with circular runway mm -hmm. where we extend the life of runway so we don't produce new. But uh, at the same time, I really feel it's, uh, it's a challenge to, to get to people to change their behavior uh, even though it's it's it, they, they get it renewed uh, with new, uh, we can remove the prints on it. But still, it's like, oh, should we should we should we just give it back and we get it? Or why should we get a new one? Or is it cheaper and so on? Uh, and then I was like, ah, oh, how 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 was that compared to plastic bags that now we are all using a a, a tote bag instead? Uh, so that would be regulation in that matter. But it takes time. Yeah. I mean, time is our, but you're completely right. Time is the biggest challenge, right? Because the level of urgency is really high. <laughs> it is really like, uh, or, you know, this is, I think it's Bill McKibben. He has this sort of, you know, there's no point in, in solving the, the, the climate crisis too slow. That, that won't get us anywhere. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so you're absolutely right. We need to be super mindful. And that also means that, you know, the solution space today and the roadmap to, to, to mitigating climate change looks different today than it would have five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago if we had uh, acted in a timely manner because we did miss that window of opportunity of, 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 of acting in a timely manner. So, so time is of the essence. And I think that also goes to um, that, yeah, that part of like not made, making, uh, having perfect get in the way of good because we also just need reductions on a very, very sort of uh, immediate scale, we, we can't only look at redu reducing in 10 years time because the risk of then having uh, exceeded the planetary boundaries to, to beyond tipping points is, is too big. So it's, yeah, it's a key, key problem of, of how do we, and that's, for me, that's also why I, I take that perspective of, of, of optimism, because I think it's what will most likely be the best tool to get us to act as quickly as possible. Um, which won't be quick enough. I think it's also, I mean, it's, uh, I'm optimistic, but I'm also aware that it's, uh, it's a little bit easy being an optimist in Copenhagen when around the world, there are already so many that are living within, with the, with the really seeing the problems of, of climate change already. So we also have a, a moral a responsibility in that sense. Yeah. It's maybe more just a reflection because mm -hmm. and to follow up on, on what you said, no matter how good we design and we design uh, to solve a problem and with a purpose and use the best material that is available at the moment, um, it all comes back to one, the consumer, we have to consume differently and we have to consume a lot less. And on the other hand, also the companies, they have to think growth in another way because as long as they think growth in the way they do today, they push and then the consumers again use. So I think it's, it is also about us as consumers, but also the companies, how, how really to run the business in, in a different way than they do it today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, one in, like, because when I started researching for, for the book and looking into the Danish design heritage, uh, I found something that I had, like I didn't I had I didn't even know that he had create, created that song. But uh, Paul Henningsen, the, we know him as the lab designer, but he also created uh, songs for the Copenhagen theaters and was a critic and, and, and that kind of thing. But so he created this song, which is like "Men binos på mon hånd, men man kan ikke os på on. So the resistance of of uh, of when we were occupied during the Second World War, and it, it was a really he um, he created the song. He wrapped it in a in a love song for a Bettinensen title and um, was then able to actually get it approved by German censorship because they didn't realize that it was a resistance song. And, but as, of course, as, you know, the first time it was placed in the theater, because people were in that experience themselves, everybody realized it and you know, got, rose up and sang along and it was like very quickly played in theaters all through Denmark. And uh, he, they wanted him, him imprisoned, but as long as there was the, the collaboration government, they weren't able to because he, he had applied for, for approval and had gotten approval. Uh, but then when the uh, collaboration government, he, he had to leave uh, the country because, of course, it's, it's not without risk to, to go up against and, and actually make a fool out of your, your occupying uh, power. But the reason I mention it is, is in the 50s, he comes back on his song and says, we've actually never been less free because mass production has had that opportunity to occupy our minds. So what the sort of physical occupation could never do, mass production succeeded at doing. And it's, uh, it's interesting when you look back in this sort of, there's this, his, his name is Bernard something, but he created this book in the 50s called Propaganda. And, the entire, and he's very uh, open about it, that it's, you know, with, with mass production, we've had this, incredible production capacity and capability. So now we need to create a demand so that there's, you know, so that someone needs all of those products that we are capable of producing. So, so somewhere along that we started, you know, uh, the, the advertising industry, we started to make sure that we as humans, um, you know, uh, centered us around what the production 
capability was rather than centering the production capabilities around what we as humans did. So, so there is definitely a need to recalibrating that. And that is uh, obviously much easier said than done, right? Because the system is, you know, uh, resilience is usually something that we strive towards. Um, in this case, it's, it's, it's definitely a challenge that the system at this point is so resilient that it's extremely difficult to, to change. Any other perspectives from the audience? So are you more positive now when you've heard did it talk? Yeah, everybody's smiling, Tita. You did your job good. <laughs> positive, but that means you will act. Yeah. That's the uh, yeah. Yeah. We need to, to work to uh, to stay positive. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It has been a huge pleasure. Uh, so Uh, and I hope we are able to, to to see your book when it's launched. Is it in August, September? September. September. So people can just write to you or how do they get it? Uh, yeah, they can follow uh, the circularway.com and uh, there will be uh, updates on, on the book. Yeah, <laughs> great. And there's a newsletter so you can get it in your inbox. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you, Didi. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. You're welcome.